But arguably, this is one of the most important topics to discuss, because even as we see the changing dynamics on the ground in the Myanmar conflict, we are, uh, which look more and more positive, we need to look to the long term and to the future and to, to enable um, transparency and justice. Uh, and that means that we have to, to, to improve how we do uh, data, fact, uh, data collection on the ground. Uh, in order to hold uh, human rights perpetrators accountable. That is the only way that Myanmar will ever be able to actually uh, acquire any form of just peace. Uh, as a super duper quick introduction, uh, IHRDG, the Institute of Human Rights and Democratic Governance, was formed this year, uh, already in uh, February 2022, with the goal of training a new generation of change makers for Myanmar. We have four uh, leading diploma programs. Uh, one is in human rights, one is in governance, We've got community development and also federalism and peace studies. And we admit between 80 and 100 students in total each year. So about 20 to 25 students. We're already at, uh, in the process of admitting our 2023 cohort. But going on to moving on to our speaker today, uh, YY Nu barely needs any introduction. She's an incredibly renowned activist and human rights defender. I myself have been familiar with her work for several years, even though I'm an economist. Uh, and, and as economists, we rarely like to talk about these very difficult political issues. Uh, Yuan Nu is a former political prisoner, but she uh, and who has, uh, for the last few years, been working as a tireless advocate to promote inclusive peace building in Myanmar across all genders, ethnicities, and religions. Uh, she's the founder of Justice for Women, a network of female lawyers that provide legal aid, and also runs awareness, awareness programs on various forms of gender abuse around Myanmar. Waiwanu holds an LLB degree from Yangon East University, uh, as well as an LLM law degree from the University of California, Berkeley. And she's currently serving as a visiting senior research fellow at the Human Rights Center at UC Berkeley. And we're very fortunate that she's joining us today all the way from Washington, D.C., um, and today, she's going to be telling uh, to to present uh, her talk on how uh, democratic opposition forces and human rights uh, organizations can build an effective international advocacy strategy to help achieve uh, justice, transitional justice in Myanmar. Uh, so, Waiwanu, would you like to begin? Thank you very much, Anders, and thank you, Sam and team, for inviting me for this incredible. Uh, webinar series, and I'm very, very honored to be here with you guys all. Um, so good morning or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are from. Um, today's uh, talk, um, I will be sharing a PowerPoint presentations and um, my talk uh, today on effective advocacy will be somehow simple and easy to understand and 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 first i will pro provide a bit of overview of the uh, current uh situations and advocacy advocacy um the responses as well as uh provide some additional tactics and and reflections on on the advocacy strategy we have and uh, hopefully this will lead to a, a thinking, a better thinking on how to strategize, how to, how to, how to differently strategize future advocacy uh, for Burma. Um, so please allow me to share my uh, PowerPoints. So just before we begin um, to give you a bit of my background, why, uh, what brought me to uh, do human rights advocacy or to become a human rights advocate. Um, um, uh, some of me, you may know, I was born in Rakhine State, um, a city called Budirong, and um, uh, to a Rohingya family, parents. Um, and I was um, in prison for, uh, for 17 years at the age of 18. And uh, growing up, discriminated as a woman and persecuted as a Rohingya. Um, and, and as a result, I guess, um, that brought me to be working on peace building and equal rights in Burma uh, while 
the violence attacks um it it um escalated or exacerbated in Rakhine state and ethnic areas I've been working on building or bringing justice and accountability to those crimes. And I still believe that this is a pathway to a truly federal democratic future in Burma. Um, yeah, I think uh, for me, I believe that um, the recognitions of our inherent dignity uh, and of the equal rights and inalienable rights of all um, and protections of those um, human rights uh, are the foundations of the freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And so that's in Myanmar. Um, and that's come from the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So without um, securing human rights and human dignity, we might not be able to build uh free and just and peace society. And that's what the Burma example today we see. So um, just to give you an overview and um, my understanding of the human rights situations in Burma, I believe that um, the, the impunity that the military uh, the impunity in general had, um, had uh, um, that the perpetrators um, enjoyed uh, for decades um, has been um, has emboldened um, the the perpetrators or the the military itself to commit atrocity to continue to commit atrocity crimes. Um, against their populations. Um, these are this is mainly because um, because of the lack of rule of law and effective uh, mechanisms to hold the military accountable and um, bring justice to victims and survivors. Um, as many of you may know, we, our um, justice systems, um, domestic justice systems uh, was um, extremely weak. Um, there wasn't rule of law before the coup and after the coup, there is um, a total collapse of the judiciary and there is no mechanisms uh, for decades until today to hold the, the Burmese uh, military accountable. So, these are um, this is the key factor why um, the atrocities are ongoing and why uh, vicious circles of the impunities are ongoing. Um, as a result, that's prolonged military dictatorships, and and now that we have uh, once again um, attempted coup. Um, uh, which we, which um, we believe is still a failure. Um, the unlawful and Ill illegal uh, seizure, seizure of power. Um, just to go a bit deeper on the situations of human rights um, and some of the key issues, is among many others. Um, when we have like uh, human rights discussions and and uh, classes, we often find that um, many individuals uh, and groups come up with their discussions wrong, having been violated of their human rights under uh, all of their human rights under the Universal Declarations of Human uh, Human Rights. So. These some of these are like the some of the uh, violations that uh, issues as that have been described on the slides are um, just an iceberg or some of the key uh, violations or areas of uh, or issues as that uh, that I like to highlight today. It is not to undermine anybody's experiences or any group's experiences or suffering. So before the attempted coup in 2021, um, the military 
And there has been persecutions of ethnic minorities for, for dec decades. Um, uh, that include air raid, uh, airstrikes, and other kinds of attacks and abuses, rape as weapon of war, and creating refugees and interna internally displaced persons as a result of these wars and uh, violence and attacks against their ethnic um, minorities. Um, specifically against their um, ethnic Rohingya, the the like many other ethnic communities, uh, the violence attack, violence or persecutions uh, against the Rohingya uh, has began way long before 2012 or 2017. Um, however, attacks and uh, attacks begins in 2012 and an image attacked in 2017, the violence, which led uh, over a million Rohingya to become refugees and burned uh, two thirds of their villages, nearly 400 villages, and killed many, uh, raped, denied, raped, uh, and mutilated many women and girls. These, um, after decades long denial of citizenships and other uh, violations, um, the the attacks has been uh, one of become one of the key human rights uh, or the most pressing human rights uh, situations in Burma before attempt, attempted coup. Um, otherwise, um, there the freedom of expressions and freedom of speech was highly attacked, and journalists and human rights defenders were targeted and imprisoned. Um, and these were some of the situations before the attempted coup. After the attempted coup, all of these situations has uh, drastically exacerbated, um, as you all know, um, the mass killing, extrajudicial killing to arbitrary arrest and detention, so thousands, um, and um, torture, severe forms of torture using in detentions and outside, uh, using sexual and gender-based violence. Um, this is some of the worst form of, uh, some of, of the intense uh, forms of uh, violations that the military has been using um, besides other forms of attacks like uh, attacking um schools and attacking um, hospitals and using airstrikes and so on. Um, um, likewise, situations in ethnic minorities uh, areas has further deteriorated. Um, the military has been using more aggressively heavy weapons and 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 once again airstrikes. Um, and creating more and more displacement. Um, nearly 2 million people have been already displaced. And uh, situations of the Rohingya and Rakhine state has uh, become more uh, concerning and serious. And the military has started to use utilize more tools of genocide and measures that um, inflict upon their life. Um, so as a result, many, many, many Rohingyas uh, started to flee, not started to increasingly flee and choose to flee from, from Rakhine, Rakhine state where they can be caught or arrested by the Burmese security forces, or um, they can be um, become victims and victims of the human traffickers. Um, oftentimes, if when they choose to flee by by boat, um, the boat were drowned or uh, stranded on Andaman Sea, and so on. The the disasters and the sufferings are ongoing, and ex the coup has fueled, um, or the military has um, been. Um, exacerbating all of this uh, violence attack against the, its people of Burma. These atrocities have been described as amount to crimes against humanity, war crimes, and um, genocide um, um, against the Rohingya by the United Nations. 
and um, other international organizations and governments. There are many, many ways that um, individuals and people of Myanmar have been fighting against the military's violence and the human rights situations, as well as fighting for democracy uh, in general. Uh, the human rights advocacy uh, is one of the tactic or one of the strategy that we can use to uh, fight against these um, vicious uh, military to end impunity and the vicious cycles of the impunity um, and atrocities in, in Burma. So this is one of the tactics that I personally have been using and many other human rights defenders are using, I guess. Um, because we believe only ending impunity um, is uh, a path to a truly uh, true peace and justice in Burma. Uh, I'm, I'm basically using Burma and Myanmar interchangeably because it's become quite used to, um, although the, the name has uh, some controversy behind it. Um, and um, when you speak in English, Using Burma me is more accustomed to than Myanmar, but again, uh, it's um, uh, I've been using it interchangeably, and I find uh, I mean disclaimer we there is we should have another discussions about the name of the country, and we I don't think we haven't been we have been able to talk uh, we have been able to talk these discussions um, around the name flags and so on so as we build a new nation so let's uh, move on to the next uh, next uh, slide so for the decades of human rights advocacy and ongoing human rights uh, um, advocacy efforts um, I, I see some changes in uh, stakeholders so um, in the past, before the attempt, attempted coup, it was mostly international human rights groups, organizations, and some local and ethnic minority human rights groups, um, uh, mostly diaspora or including diaspora and human rights defenders. Um, I mean, yes, we had um, decades of um, military dictatorship after the 1988 revolutions, there were a mass uh, democracy movement and there were um, they were a very um, active or intense uh, human rights advocacy period. Um, at some point um, before the 2010 um, militaries transition to so-called democracy, uh, there was um, in in from 2007 to 2009, there was an attempt by the diaspora uh, uh, to create an international commissions of inquiry against the military's violations. But then in 2010, when transition to democracy occurred, uh, there was uh, negotiations with the government and um, democracy leaders um, and, and the attempt to create commissions of inquiry was washed away. Uh, so basically, military got free ticket in 2010. And after 2010, after the elections, they got free ticket for the past crimes. So I'm not going to go deeper into those period and situations, but I'm just, I guess, I'm implying these um, presentations, um, the advocacy effort from 2011 to 2021, which um, I'm describing or referring here as before attempted coup, and then after attempted coup in 2021. So during this 10 years of period, although we had gross human rights violations in country, including the commissions of genocides against the Rohingya and uh, crimes against humanity against Kachins and Shans and other ethnic communities. At that time, um, I, there has very little uh, space or discussions around the human rights, uh, true human rights uh, advocacy or 
accountability and justice. Uh, the human rights was a the human rights topic or issue was a taboo issue. There was people believed that there wasn't human rights violations in in Burma, including politicians and leaders, and um, and therefore there were only some uh, groups, um, including us. Um, and uh, some individual who were able to stand uh, for human rights, uh, who were able, who, who stood for human rights, who had courage to stood for human rights. Um, uh, yet we were able to make some substantial um, improvement, although we weren't able to prevent uh, genocide and mass atrocities. Um, um, I will discuss those um, um, uh, those improvements or those some of those later on. After the attempted coup, I think that more and more local and international organizations get involved in human rights advocacy, uh, sp uh, specifically on justice and accountability. And ethnic minority organizations continue to become more more and more active. And now that we have a national unity government and national unity consultative councils and other um, democratic forces um, uh, from this uh, spring revolutions trying to um, become more and more active on the international human rights advocacy. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's probably, um, it is not a great time for the country. This is the worst situations or the worst situ human rights situations uh, in Burma history, uh, yet the public awareness and involvement is also um, um, at peak. Um, some of the major demands from previous and now the current uh, human rights advocacy uh, has been um, I guess I must say it's similar, um, uh, but now some of the calls become more uh, more aggressive or active. For example, economic sanctions, although the, the stakeholders working on the international human rights advocacy in the past has called for the economic sanctions prior to the coup against the military and its, mil uh, uh, its businesses, there were uh, oppositions inside the government at that time or other actors uh, who, who, who who were opposed to, to the idea of economic sanctions against the military. Um, but now that call has become more, um, I think, a, a key call or a key uh, um, ask uh, these days. And um, the second demand is the arms embargo or oh, arms embargo and and including the sanctions on the av aviation fuel um, and enabling cross border aids and this is also new calls after the attempted coup um, because the, there is uh, no access for the humanitarian organizations to provide uh, effective humanitarian aids uh, to the conflict affected area especially in Sagai and Magui and, and some of the border areas. So only cross-border aid uh, will allow and able um, people to be able to access to the humanitarian aid. So therefore, cross-border aids become one of the major call um, these days. And lastly, the justice and accountability uh, for all people of Myanmar that include criminal accountability for the perpetrators of Myanmar, uh, perpetrators, uh, the, 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 the Myanmar military. Um, these uh, uh, stakeholders and calls, uh, these, uh, these stakeholders has been targeting um, some of the, the governments uh, before attempted coup, uh, governments and in, uh, international community as a whole, uh, uh, specifically some governments and, and, and bodies and entities. So before attempted coup, it was uh, mostly the Western countries, United States, United Kingdom, European Union, and uh, including the uh, organizations of the Islamic cooperations 
related to the violations against the Rohingya. And um, uh, um, it was it was I think partly because the human rights advocacy wasn't very popular since the country has opened up people uh, countries and governments didn't see there was a need to address human rights situations as as Burma supposedly gained democracy right um so but then uh many of us targeted these like-minded countries with the hope that they would still um, see the uh, addressing impunity as a priority and and bringing justice as a priority um and we also i think the 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 united nations has been one of the uh one of the main um in bodies or institution that everybody would go for human rights um awareness and and accountability stuff um, of course, the we uh, the UN General Assembly and UN Security Council and UN Human Rights Council as a as a platform because these are, I think the these three places um, mechanisms institutions are places where um, decision can be made, uh, but I think um, there are other uh, UN bodies and entities. Uh, including special procedures, has been uh, used as a leverage points or raising the momentums um, as a strategic uh, advocacy purposes for the SPS strategic advocacy purposes. And High Commission's Commissioner for Human Rights has been um, has has played a crucial part as well. And 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 High Commissioners were usually a target a target of primary. Um, influence as well, and then I've attempted coup. In addition to the, these actors, um, the ASEAN member states and governments are uh, become also primary targets. Uh, mainly Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore. Um, uh, these countries become uh, primary targets as well, and and um, and more and more governments. Uh, uh, started to take careful or cautious um, uh, approach to Burma, unlike uh, previous and um, unlike the um, uh, unlike before the coup, including India, Japan, Australia, and China. Um, till today, um, China, uh, especially China, hasn't shown. Um, their clear positions on on military or uh, open engagement with the military yet. Uh, India is also having a very careful approach to the to engaging with the military, although it seems like they have a bit more um, favoring towards the engaging with the military or supporting military. But still, it's a great um, it it's it's a very interesting and and. Um, interesting and great um, uh, opportunity for us to see how these countries, even these countries traditionally allies of the military or authoritarian governments, uh, taking a careful and cautious uh, stance to engage with the military. And, um, and Japan, Korea, and Australia has actually uh, make more progress and they have uh, started to disengage with the military uh, more and more and, and started to uh, join um, some of the other like-minded countries to uh, sanctions or to um, take actions against the military. So these are some progress, I think, and therefore they are, as well as, as they play as they, as many of these countries are our neighboring countries, and it, as they play a crucial part in in Burma economically and uh, politically, I think these are some of the new primary targets for the human rights advocacy, uh, because uh, they can be um, a blockage to the advocacy. So since we have opportunity 
uh, now space now it is important that the human rights uh, advocacy uh, groups engage with these countries and and lastly yeah we uh, i think the uh, primary targets continue to be the un general assembly security councils and human rights council specifically on the justice and accountability holding the uh, military leaders criminally accountable. Uh, Security Council uh, uh, role is crucial. Security Council plays uh, a key role and they uh, are the only institution who can uh, create um, a court or uh, refer situations of Myanmar to the ICC. Although these days we're trying to explore whether it can be possible through the UN General Assembly or the Human Rights Council. So far, um, international uh, responses on the Myanmar has been uh, quite slow and I must say in, ineffective. Um, the uh, It took... Um, the U.S. government, U.S. Congress, uh, for a long time to pass Burma Act. They finally included, integrated into the NDAA, uh, National Defense Authorizations Act. So the the Burma Act, um, which uh, is a legislation to uh, sanction the military and military businesses and to support uh, the pro-democracy movement, as well as uh, to work on the um, accountability for the military. Um, The advocacy on the Burma Act has been ongoing over the past four years, uh, but then it took them several years to even include, integrate in the NDAA. And it took the U.S. for uh, um, five years to make uh, genocide determinations t- since 2017. So last year, um, no, this year actually in March uh, 28th, uh, the US government has made uh, uh, atrocity determinations and declared that the violence against the Rohingya uh, is uh, genocide and crimes against humanity. And um, um the U.S. also has increased uh, or increased um, its sanction SDN list, uh, sanction list of the individuals as well as business entities related to uh, military. The U.K. also posed some sanctions against the military and its related businesses and um, and. Um, Conform uh, that uh, its willingness to intervene in the international criminal uh, international court of justice case against the Rohingya. Um, both countries has recently, after the years of advocacy, both countries has recently actually uh, expressed that they are 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 their support to the international. Uh, uh, to to the referral of the Myanmar situations to the International Criminal Court. And I think these are also a great advocacy progress because the United States um, has always been quite allergic to the International Criminal Court and they are, um, um, over the past, I think, um, even before two years, even two years ago or uh, a years ago, a year ago, the U.S. Um, wouldn't even like to mention international criminal court uh, due to their own internal politics and policy. However, it's I think it's a great progress that they publicly said they are going to support uh, a referral of the situations of Myanmar to international criminal court. Um, I think what we need is that to change that um, that uh, expressions or that uh, position to uh, to to 
the U.S. taking or the U.K. taking leadership to refer situations of Myanmar to the International Criminal Court, not only support. Um, going back to the European Union, European Union has actually made substantial progress, including sanctioning on the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise and other military related businesses and um, and also recognitions of the NUG as a legitimate government of Myanmar. Um, and um, since the coup, I think they have uh, disengaged with the Myanmar military and businesses and uh, a lot of them in in their in in Burma. So I think I think we really need to um, they, there is a acknowledge that there is a substantial progress from the European Union side. Other governments like Canada, New Zealand, uh, Japan um, uh, has made some progress as well, including um, uh, sanctions. And uh, well, for Canada, I think Canada has been really good uh, in terms of um, they make genocide determination as well. And they actually uh, impose a lot of the sanctions, including uh, first uh, international sanctions, sanctions on the international jet fuel supplies. Japan also suspended its trainings, uh, training programs with the military, although they could be doing a lot more. But uh, I think these are these are some of the uh, great progress that um, the uh, that has the progress that has been made, but. Um, they were all slow and late. Um, yet I think we should just, uh, there's still, th therefore, because it's slow and late, therefore, I think the discussion today, uh, effective advocacy is relevant. And uh, from the U United Nations sites, um, the UN Security Council finally adopted a resolution, which is, a week, however, which is huge. It is not easy for a UN Security Council to pass a resolution, but yet last week they passed um, a resolution and it, it, it has an element of reporting, requirement of reporting by the UN Secretary General. So which is, I think, uh, really good for the country as uh, as uh, as there is there will be a reporting um, to the UN Security Council means that means that the Myanmar agenda will be on top of the UN Security Council agenda. Therefore, we have a opportunity to further uh, pursue um, uh, uh, human rights advocacy and push the UN Security Council to take more concrete actions. Um, they have made several presidential statements before, and they were a very, very weak statement. Doesn't actually make uh, do much. So, therefore, the resolution was very uh, important uh, for us. I think this is the first resolutions on on Burma over the past thirty years. So, which is which I believe, although is quite disappointing that it is not as strong as we want, but still is a major um, turning point uh, from the UN Security Council. And um, and, and UN General, Assemb General Assembly has uh, uh, passed resolutions on, on, on Myanmar. Um, the, and Credential Committee also um, defer, uh, I think, keep the, defer the, decisions on the credential um, credential challenge. Uh, therefore, uh, Ambassador Ujo Motong remain as a, as a Myanmar representative, uh, although his role has likely been degraded, downgraded. Um, uh, but I think uh, from the UN generally, General Assembly side, they have done... Um, as much as they could, including the credential committee and general assembly resolution, which is uh, which 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 were quite good actually. It include rec um, rec uh, recognitions of the democratic forces as well, 
although it did not um, uh, clearly, how do I say that, explicitly recognize their national unity government yet, but they are quite good. And from the Human Rights Council, they also have a regular Human Rights Session, Human Rights Council sessions and resolutions and statements, um, and uh, several interactive dialogues with the with the civil society and other stakeholders, including um, interactive dialogue with a special reporter on, on the human rights situations of Myanmar, and um, as well as a report and briefing by the by the head of the double I double M international investigative mechanisms on Myanmar. Uh, these, um, these uh, dialogues in the human rights council and discussions um, in the uh, human rights councils and general assemblies are critical. I think at some point, it, these are the places, the, 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 these are main uh, uh, institution, how do I say, institution entities that uh, build a momentum for uh, further actions and and um, uh, further actions or concrete actions and and pressures. Once you lose the momentum in the Human Rights Council or in the General Assembly, there is unlikely that anything would occur at the Security Council. So keeping the um, Myanmar agenda or discussions at the Human Rights Council and General Assembly is uh, crucial uh, to have any sort of actions by the UN Security Council as well as by the governments like US government and, and uh, UK government or other European governments. Uh, who has power to do some um, to take some action? So, so I guess you know uh, when you when people um, see the international responses, um, it can be very depressing and very um, very depressing and very uh, uh, intangible. But I think all of the all of the actions here and there in combine um and that's how i think you build a momentum and you build you push for the greater actions um and 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 you know patience is is crucial in this in this space as well um one of the most disappointing um regional bodies body is is the asean i mean there are other region regional bodies in the in the around the world, including African Union, European Union. Um, the unfortunately ASEAN um, the is is a is a very weak uh, regional body, especially when it's come to the human rights. Um, uh, yet I think it is also I think quite encouraging to to see that they are at, at least some there is at least some uh, active um, discussions and involvement and since the coup um, all, and they have come up with a five point consensus with the military although the, these five point consensus are not complied by the military themselves and they were from the first place they were not actually very strong uh, to to the situations on the, on the ground and the military's uh, attitude and behavior uh, but one of the great good thing that the ASEAN uh, has done is disinviting the junta to to some of uh, some of the meetings and and including the ASEAN summit. So I think this this is a great uh, success and and progress and ASEAN ASEAN has has made as well. Although they are not quite um, effective or uh, efficient to address Burma human rights uh, crisis. Um, although, so I think it is it is important to understand how reliable it is or how 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 reliable ASEAN can be and and where uh, uh, where we put them in in, in the human rights um, uh, advocacy strategy.
and and, and because it, it is it is quite important body as well as an international community think mm, there is a perspective or uh, perceptions that um the regional bodies can address their regional problem therefore international community doesn't need to get involved uh, especially western countries they stay more and more um tend to rely on their regional bodies um because ASEAN is a weaker institution and than other regional uh, bodies, um, I think it is important that we have a clear expectations and an understanding of the body and raise uh, the awareness about it. Uh, on top of the uh, international actions responses uh, after the coup, there are um few key uh, justice processes ongoing, um, including independent investigative mechanisms for Myanmar, double um, I double M, following the International Fact Finding Missions on Myanmar FFM report. So the investigative mechanisms is still working and it has actually released um, an annual report yesterday. Uh, no, the day before yesterday. So please go ahead and check the report. Um, and um, and then the International Criminal Court also continue to investigate uh, the situations in Myanmar um, from the um, angle of post deportations of Rohingya to Bangladesh. But my understanding is that the court is now investigating um, all other related crimes uh, beyond forced de de deportation. Um, and then we have a genocide case before the International Court of Justice uh, brought by the Gambia versus Myanmar. Once, um, uh, our hope is that once the court make decisions on the on the genocide, and then it will open up doors and space for further criminal accountability um, through the UN Security Council or other uh, venues. Um, as uh, as International Court of Justice is, is not a criminal um, court, they cannot punish the military. Um, but their decisions and their orders become uh, uh, a crucial, um, a key, I think, leverage point for us to call for further actions and, and the UN Security Council need to act after their court decision. And now that um, more and more people have started to explore universal jurisdictions, um, and uh, we have now one case in Argentina, and I understand there is uh, attempt to. There are some attempts uh, to bring universal jurisdiction cases in Tur Turkey, Australia, and Indonesia, and and other peoples. Peoples are also exploring to other countries such as Germany, um, Ireland, and so on. <coughs> So I guess over the past 10 years, these four major um, justice processes uh, happened, developed, and which, uh, which I must say, quite, quite unique, um, quite phenomenal. Uh, it is not easy to have even one um, mechanisms or one processes in this uh, space while there is a uh, very little political will on Myanmar situations, uh, but we have in four ongoing processes. Although these are not adequate to uh, to bring uh, justice, um, but these are great, great progress. Um, especially the International Court of Justice at case. Uh, we hope they will it will provide a broader. Um, discussions, uh, it will open door on broad, broader discussions around justice and reparations beyond the criminal accountability of the military leaders. Okay, now, you know, we have 
ongoing advocacy efforts and international responses, but I would like to provide some of the challenges and opportunity that we we have. Um, uh, talking about some challenges um, um, among with the international community, um, like I said earlier, there is little to no interest on, on Myanmar issue, and therefore there is lack of uh, political will from key governments such as the U.S., um, in compare with the Ukraine and other cases, you can see, uh, you can clearly see where political wills and interests lies on. Um, the UN Security Council inadequate actions, and there's a veto power, always a fear of veto power. Uh, but I think it's once again about the leaderships. Once there is a leadership, so they and we have a strong case of the trusty crimes in Burma, and veto power should not be a threat for a case. Uh, in Burma. And over-reliance on the ASEAN five-point consensus and ASEAN institutions. I, we see this as a challenges uh, for, for, among uh, uh, with the international community. And insight, these are external challenges. What are internal set challenges we have? Um, there's no unified or inclusive uh, advocacy strategy with consistent messaging. Like NUG is doing their own advocacy and other human rights groups are doing their own ad advocacy and ethnic uh, groups are doing their own advocacy. I think that if there is a more collective approach as needed. Um, so there is no proactive or, uh, uh, or, or proactive media strategy to address the, to, to, to keep the momentum internationally, uh, awareness uh, internationally. Um, I mean, there are many other challenges, but I will just uh, uh, highlight these two. And then what are the um, opportunities? Uh, having the international double I double M investigation and court cases, justice processes itself is a plus. It's already we are on, in the halfway. So, um, so, you know, we can use it uh, to actually... Um, to uh, to 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 amplify or to to support our ongoing um, advocacy, there are more allies from the governments and and human rights group. More countries are started to support their human rights advocacy um, uh, processes, and uh, more actions against the Burmese military than before. Obviously, before the attempted coup. So uh, these are, I think. Uh, uh, opportunity and, and and time that we have. And then um, internally among the pro-democracy movement, a greater unity and level of trust between the ethnic uh, minorities and, and Burmese majority. And then greater awareness about the atrocities committed against the, uh, all people uh, and ethnic minorities, including the Rohingya. In the past, people didn't believe that there was human rights violations or um, Balance against the ethnic uh, minorities, uh, but now that people started to believe more and more of this is possible because as they as they witness it happen to them and their families, uh, the use of social media to raise awareness uh, by the by the uh, individuals and and people in Burma has has been. Um, I think having been this platform um, give us a lot of strength and power to. Um, as an opportunity to 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 further build uh, momentum, and um, and 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 to just like um, give you perspective or summarize for for those who are in this school, some um, I mean, tactical part of the advocacy is uh, quite um, quite delicate, and and it is not a science; it's an art. But overall, I think a lot of the uh, institutions and, and and human rights group has used uh, these um, me um, methods, um, simple methods like to documenting the situations and investigating and raising awareness using social media, publishing and, and writing letters and statements and collaborating with others, other people, and then actually doing advocacy. Uh, explaining, meeting with the key stakeholders and convincing them to take actions and policies. So this is the wrap up how how you you actually do human rights advocacy. But I think the key is um, how do you um, document, um, 
how do you do documentation to rely in a credible and reliable manner um, and which can be used, uh, used for the effective strategy. And then taking opportunity for the time. And this time, uh, the, these will not last for forever. The interest that they we have, attention that, that we have, might not last forever. There are many other uh, crises around the world, and there will be new crises, and and we cannot as uh, waste time. So we need to grab the time and opportunity, and and uh, building coalitions with diverse and unique groups. Um, so basically, it, my own experience uh, doing advocacy on 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 the creations of fact finding missions in in the United Nations Human Rights Council. When you go alone to talk to the um, to the policymakers and key stakeholders, it's not powerful. When you go together as diverse group, uh, show your unity, your strength, your collective calls, and it's become stronger. This is what we need at this at the, at, the, at this moment because Burma is a, such a diverse country. People want to see that these calls are consistent and these calls are collective. So. So when you join hands with others, you are stronger. That that's 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 the that's a key in advocacy, and that's a key, that's that's the most powerful thing that I have learned over the past ten years of advocacy. Um, and you need to involve, you need to bring human story, involve people who are uh, directly affected, and 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 don't shy away from taking ownership of the. Of the situation, you don't say that you know because it's happened to the Rohingya community and they have the it's their problem, it's not your problem. But but the country has to own its own problem. Uh, all the violence and all the crimes that have uh, occurred against uh, on the on on our soil. So that's that's one of the key thing. But now there is a tendency for for example some uh, groups. Uh, uh, or NUG groups or some other Burmese groups tend to do advocacy on 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 just the violence against against uh, Burman majority, but often forget or undermine or dismiss um, historical violence or persecutions against their ethnic and religious minorities. And once you do that, once you started to do that, you become weaker. And it is important that once we do our own advocacy as we consider ourselves uh, others as others, if we cannot see the entire country's people as one and you try to do advocacy on one issue or one group, um, once you started to do that, you minimize others and and then you, you automatically, your messages and your calls become um, like uh, weaker and and they're not credible enough. So these are key key things that I have learned and use many leverage points as possible. And and again, it is not enough to just raise awareness on social media or 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 meeting with the stakeholders and ask them to do this and that. But also, you need to be able to provide a solution. So once let's say once the military is held accountable and how are you going to promise new country? How are you willing to build a new country? What are the promises? What are your solution not to happen this again? So giving us a solution itself is, is a, is a key. And lastly, um, persistence is key uh, advocacy. You cannot do this one off. You cannot do it for one month or one year. Uh, you have to do it. You have to have a long-term goal and long-term persistence. Call persistent strategy uh, and persistent actions is key to any kinds of advocacy success. And if you do so, progress is possible. Um, it shows in many cases, including Burma Act, including UN Security Council resolution, including the genocide determination by the U.S. Uh, US government. So progress is possible, but the key is persistency. And um, lastly, for me, um, I believe that human rights advocacy for, for justice um, in Burma is is it should be our strategy because. Uh, international community only has a responsibility to 
uh, protect your human rights. They don't have a responsibility to bring your political systems the way that you want, whether democracy or dictatorship. International governments or community cannot interfere in your political uh, future or political systems, but they can. They have a responsibility to protect your human rights. Therefore, we can use human rights advocacy as a strategy uh, to build a federal democracy that we want. But at the same time, it should be a goal for the country to really build a just and inclusive uh, future for all. Uh, I thank you all and looking forward to our discussions and happy to answer any questions. Our space today, our age is much different than what we have, even early 2017 or early 1990s or, you know, prior to that. Um, we didn't have a social media at that time, right? And prior to 2017, we have social media, but the public understanding of the human rights awareness about the atrocity is very, very low, right? But now that many people in Burma understand the atrocities, the violence, the human rights violations, and it is incredible to see how young people started to just become responsible citizens and started to use their social media as a tool to communicate with the wider public as well as international community on social on on Facebook and Twitter and this is the power of public advocacy this is the power of public uh, pressure only only once the noise is out there, then you can build a momentum to take actions against the military. So once public awareness is not there, once the issue is not on the social media, and therefore not on the media, uh, conventional media, and there is, it is extremely harder to make impact or to make the human rights advocacy effective. You need to do extra work. But now, in the past, it was only human rights defenders and leaders, civil society leaders and political leaders who would do this uh, work. But now every individual, regardless of who you are, you can be a farmer or a student or a mother, it doesn't matter. You can get involved and you can take actions. And a lot of the time, this public um, reportings are crucial to even gather evidences. Now, uh, even double I double M. So the center that I double uh, I double M is using this open source investigation method. Now, the center that um, I'm affiliated with, the Human Rights Center, um, they have developed this tool to investigate open sources. Means the uh, investigating the photos that has been posted by the um, individuals in Zagain or in Magui or in Rakhine, a video that people post from there. And therefore, their videos can be used for the criminal investigations of the, uh, of the military, of, of these violence. So what I'm trying to say is that there are many ways that people can use social media, but the key is to use it. You know, just you post a, a primary uh, source, like uh, taking a photo of the scene or violence and post it on the social media or taking a video of the event. And these are powerful. Or you can use social media to raise awareness, to motivate people by through arts or other forms. Like there are many artists using social media, right? These are ways as well. But I think the key is using the social media, if possible, use primary sources and give them uh, 
a description, explanation, where you have taken, when you have taken, what happened, who involved in the videos and demography, all of this, uh, it's, it's crucial. And these can be used as a uh, evidence, as evidence for the criminal in, in, uh, investigation. One of the things you can do right now is to document what happened among with, um, in your neighbors. Uh, it could be among your family or to your friend, whoever you know, and raise awareness about it uh, by using social media and contact about them um, to organizations or NUG government, human rights ministry, or international organization like IIIM. This is the story of them. There are public emails that you can send. They actually check those emails once you file a case. When you send a case, they actually read them. Uh, so you can send their cases. So these cases will be stored somewhere. And once we have discussions around justice and accountability, these cases will 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 met. These cases will be met. Uh, well, uh, this, I think, I think this this is one of the way that you can and uh, we can, you can do. Otherwise, you know, see what is happening in in Burma, in your neighbor, in your city, in the in in entire country, and raise awareness about it. Uh, only when you speak up, we will be able to stop them. If we don't speak up, we won't be able to stop them. So it is important to speak up, uh, to talk about the truth, to talk about the situations. Uh, if you say silence and and it will become harder and the violence will prolong. And also, you know, coming from where we were prior to the coup, please don't, I think I think sometimes people see like um, if the violences are happening not in their region or not against the ethnic communities, they think it's not related to them, but it is wrong. And these days, you know, people around the world speak up for the people in other countries, right? So if we are living in one country in Burma, um, if the violence is against other cities or other communities, it is related to you, remember. Therefore, we need to speak up for other people, if, if even if we see you know, people in our own country as others. They're not other people. And because if we don't speak up for other people, they will come to us. And this is the experiences we lived in today. So therefore, speak up for others as well. There are many ways that you can speak up. Yes, of course, joining these kind of for, um, discussions is also important. Um, and so that we learn more and so that we can become better in advocating for our country, for our people. Uh, and, you know, use social media is the most powerful tool if you don't know anything other than and if you don't have any other contact or everything. Race, mobilize your 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 neighbors, your family to be active and you and you can mobilize it to you by becoming yourself active. Uh, so first question's wrong, um, documentations. I think it depends on the goal, uh, goal uh, how you gonna use these informations about. Are you gonna use them for raising awareness on social media, on, on public? Or are you going to use them for um, archiving? Or are you going to use them for criminal investigations? Or are you going to use them to send to United Nations bodies? Or uh, it depends on the goal. Uh, I think the most basic one is just keeping the news record with folders uh, with cat by categories. And then you can refer those news, uh, news uh, and, and those events once you use your social media 
a post or a social media strategy or once you want to share with other people. That's the most basics. And otherwise, um, human rights, uh, basics, human rights documentations. I mean, there are organizations that provide their templates that are available as well. But the basics uh, format would include uh, who, when, uh, how, uh, what happened, and where, you know, all of this. Who are the perpetrators? Who are these the victims? When happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? And what happened to them? And um, if you want to take it a bit farther, what's their current status? For example, if they're detained, uh, are they released or are they sentenced? Or if they're sentenced, what happened to them? So these are some of the basics human rights format you would need um, to send a case to the UN different bodies like uh, to the special procedures such as special reporters, treaty bodies or um, other UN institutions so that they can take actions uh, for you. Um, and um, if you want to have a, a, a human rights documentation that can be used for the criminal um, investigations or legal cases, then you might need to work with a lawyer that would meet the standard evidence collections method. So it's depend on the goal. Um, I must say these the, the, the previous two methods are two simple way that everyone can actually do. Um, and um, yeah, it's important that where where it's happened, when happened, who involved, who is the perpetrators and who is the victims and, and what happened to them details. Um, so these are key, key, key questions. I think, yes, raise, I don't think there's enough attention on Myanmar now. Um, we don't have enough attention um, internationally. We need more um, activism, uh, social media and private and public act activism uh, everywhere. Um, more action needed on Twitter or Facebook. Um, we're losing the momentum. We're losing the attention and interest. We didn't have enough from the beginning, by the way. Um, therefore, I think more active engagement, more awareness is, is essential. Uh, so that's the first step. Second step, um, if you are in the field of advocating um, with the policymakers, with the institutions, um, then it is important that you work collaboratively with other people. Human rights advocacy is never effective if you do alone. You need to uh, build allies and coalitions. You need to collaborate with other organizations and individuals, uh, especially in the case of Myanmar. As I said earlier in my presentation, at least you need to be able to form domestic coalition, domestic um, people uh, like alliance with the people within Burma, with different ethnic communities, uh, come together to speak to the, to speak out loud through their public statement forms or other actions or actual advocacy meeting stuff. If you come together, it's, it's, it's powerful. And that's how the international community take action. If you go alone, they're not going to listen to you. If you go together, they're gonna listen to you and they take actions. So that's the key. And, and that has been, I think, mentioned in my in my presentation, but it's 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 so true. Uh, and right now, let's say if the NUG um or other uh entities can work together in a more collaborative manner, and if they bring more diverse community. In, uh, on board and and come the messages from a more diverse community perspective and and show it showcase it to the world and and they become more effective they will become more effective and more countries will there will be more support from the international community but now um once the international community see you divided 
and see you uh, dismissive of other people, then they're not going to support. So that's that's the key thing, what is missing in this space, in this moment. We have an opportunity now, the spring revolution, the power of people. But then I think those who have a more... Um, um, a, a more um, m- uh, those who are in a position where they can engage with the international community who have more power um, if they are more strategic and more responsible we can use this time and opportunity once and for all to take the military down um, I think there is more genuine um, collaborations and genuine um more uh, vision visionary leaders um are needed uh, for better collaborations and effective effort um it is easier to say than done so i understand but i think uh we 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 need to try and and you all if you're in that position that you can make any decision or you can take actions please do if not Please advise or suggest your leaders. You know you need to 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 take the right path or right actions, and you have the power now. And DAA, yes, it has the limitations. Many, although it's a great support, and the um. The how and how to provide uh, support and how much and how it will flow, the money will flow, will be determined by the uh, by the Congress and its procedures. So money is not coming to the democracy forces directly. You know, they're not sending you any money. It will come through their um, uh, processes and, and bureaucracy. Um, and it will be determined soon. Uh, and it's not that, for example, NUG is getting all the money, not like that. Um, just to make it clear, there is like perceptions and people talking about it. So we just want to make sure that. And also it, the support is, uh, for example, support for the democracy movement, resistance movement is limited to technical support. So means they're not going to provide they're not going to sell weapon or, but they are going to be able to provide technical support. For example, uh, um, I would say like uh, providing technical support on on some standardization, some tactics, stuff like that. Uh, in addition to the humanitarian support, so I think it's it's a huge success, advocacy success for the for the uh, for for the for the country because even for technical support it's not easy actually it's not an easy call and it's not an easy support from the US congress but yes of course ukraine got the you know the um support as well but it's situations in burma um and there are a lot of differences if you compare with the ukrainian situation so there is no reason, no interest for the U.S. to provide Burmese people, uh, arming Burmese people, while there is no central um, command, uh, change of command. Uh, it might. I think there are a lot of other considerations. If 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 in this situations where there is no change of command and no central army, central body in one place if they provide arms to a lot of groups and it will just create, exacerbate uh, or create uh, a more um, conflict or con- unintended consequences. So I think there are a lot of other con- uh, considerations around the uh, providing support to the especially PDF, although they are going to provide some support to the PDF, but it's not until now, it's not, um, anything relate, directly related to arming the PDF.
um, justice um, and accountability. Um, uh, uh, which group should be prioritized? There is no group to prioritize. Justice and accountability for everybody. Um, justice for everyone. Justice against every, every, I think what is important is to have a really a comprehensive and effective transitional justice processes that would tackle needs of the different groups and different individuals. So every um, the, the tactics that military has to use may be similar. The impact of those tactics might not be similar depending on which group they are or who they are, right? So since the country is so diverse um, and the nature of the violences and, and the impact of the violences are diverse. So therefore, once we have a transitional justice mechanism that would tackle the needs uh, of the different, different uh, groups, um, then we will be able to address all. Human rights violations are human rights violations, regardless of who they are, uh, regardless of their groups, um, even if they don't involve in the democracy movement actively. Um, if they are targeted for mass killing, if they're targeted for human rights violations, they should be getting um, justice as well. So that's the, that's the I think, basic thinking. That should be the basic thinking of the justice. If we only provide justice to those who we favor, those who um, uh, our allies, then it is it does not mean justice for the society or for the country. Um, the justice for the society, for our future, uh, for our con future country, is should be justice for everybody who deserves justice. Everybody who whose rights has been violated, who has been affected by these heinous crimes by the military. All the perpetrators should be held accountable. Um, at the same time, the victims and survivors need to have a proper rehabilitations and restorations of their justice. Uh, so that's it. That's the last uh, 2022 public seminar that IHRDG is hosting this year. Uh, we will hopefully return with another uh, lineup of amazing speakers next year. Please follow us on Facebook. Uh, please sign up for our Telegram communication channel. Uh, hopefully within a few weeks, there'll be a uh, edited version of this recording up on YouTube so that you can also share it with your friends uh, and raise more awareness. Mm -hmm.